In today's episode of the Neil Wilkins podcast, I'm joined by Philip Steeman, who is a well self-confessed SEO specialist. Uh, he has a YouTube channel talking all things search engine optimization. Uh, he has experience in web development and pretty much content marketing expertise right across the board. So who better to welcome onto this show to talk about search engine optimization and all of those things that challenge us marketers day in and day out. So welcome to the program, Philip. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited for this one. Yeah, me too. And I, th I think this is one of those things that we can all, in, in my industry, I mean, I've been doing marketing for many decades, and I would never say I'm an expert or even a specialist in SEO, but I know that every single day, it is something that challenges me. It's something that I need to get better and better at. And I know that everybody I work with or work on behalf of, there might be a client or somebody I'm teaching, is asking the same set of questions, which is, how do I keep on top of SEO? How do I understand what is most important in SEO? And really, the big question is, why do I keep getting it wrong? So I'm hoping that, Philip, you can help guide us in terms of some of the best practice, some of the things really to um, really focus on and prioritize in this whole world, this whole world of SEO, because it's complicated, isn't it? It definitely is, for sure. And it's constantly changing. It's, it's so funny because um, the thing about constant change is if we just go a couple of years back with SEO, we had maybe four Google core updates. That's when you know Google updates every search result and every different query that you can search. We had maybe four a year. And if we just look back to the last three months, we've had four or five core updates. So you're absolutely right. It's constantly changing. And it's also because of AI content and there's just a lot of stuff happening at the moment. So for me, it's, it's super interesting, but it's also frustrating for a lot of people. And, and I understand why. This is something clearly you are super passionate about and you clearly keep um, on top of this. How, how did you come to find SEO? Because I understand, I mean, your, your kind of earlier sort of career was very much in the web development and content creation and, and building kind of um, personalities for brands really online and digitally. So, so why SEO? It, it's a brilliant question because ever since I think I was 13 when I started programming at first and the thing about programming, I, I just love the aspect of solving issues and it was the same that I found in SEO because I started in the technical aspect of SEO, just focusing on making websites to load faster, focusing on that they are structured correctly, that images are used properly and all these technical aspects, that was what I found interesting. And then later on, I transitioned into understanding how content could work with a structured website and together would work in harmony, basically. And yeah, that's basically where the magic happened for me. And, and I, was, I was sold on SEO. I love the, the technical aspect of it. I love how difficult it is that there isn't one way to do it. There are a million ways to do it. And you can also do it wrong a million different ways. So. It's definitely the, the aspect of how difficult it is and the way that you can solve it in so many different ways. I think it's super interesting. Mm. So I, I know we're going to dive into some of those uh, those ways and those methods uh, in a minute, but I kind of just the way you described that, it made me think, that is this kind of like trying to solve a, a puzzle? Is this trying to solve a, a challenge? I mean, if you were a detective, for example, it would sound like SEO would be your thing because it would be something that is trying to, trying to sort of take the clues and the ideas and some of the feedback you're getting and then figure out how to make something different or how to understand something. Have I, have I got that right? It feels like it's quite a, a sort of a logical unpicking of information to learn. Is, is, is that a way of describing it? Absolutely, yes. It's, it's a bit like seeing you have 200 different buttons that you can twist and turn a little bit and then you get an output in the end. And, and that's, that's how it is. That's definitely the interesting aspect that you can do so many different ways to positively impact your rankings on Google. Mm. So, so if somebody's been looking at this and they're not very familiar with numbers or 
you know, with patterns or with logic. And, you know, they don't come from a um, like a web development or coding uh, kind of background where it is very, very sort of logical. It's, you know, you put in a one rather than a zero and you get a different output. Um, but they come more from maybe a creative angle and they're being tasked with, OK, you have to improve the performance of our website. So they might then default into, OK, well, I'll change the branding, I'll change the colors, I'll change the look of it. And I might think about some of the content. It feels then the way you're describing it, though, Philip, that they're actually missing the point that a lot of the power of website performance doesn't come from actually how it looks. It comes from what's behind the scenes. Have I got that right? Definitely, yeah. It's it's so important to understand that we can create good content, but if you're creating content on a foundation that is not a solid foundation, which is the performance, the structure and everything, then you're basically pulling yourself back a bit and just like taking two steps ahead and one step back all the time. So it's so important to get that foundation right to begin with. You can also do it later on, but really get that right and then start writing content because there's no uh, there's no doubt that content is still super important. It's the content that is ranking, but the content can only rank if you have the foundation right. Mm. So, so it'd be interesting to split this out. I hadn't really thought we'd be talking about this, but I think, you know, for a lot of people listening, this would be interesting. But could we split out the difference then between an approach for SEO if you've got an existing website and you're looking to um, maybe combat a competitor who has clearly taken a lead on you for something they're doing. You might not know what it is, but they're doing something. So you've got an existing website and you, you want to improve the SEO on it and then split that out from something where you've just described there, starting from the beginning. So we have no website. We might have some branding, some ideas for initial content but we're beginning from ground zero. What different approaches would you take in those two cases? Great question. So if we start with the existing website, here, as you say, we'll combat a competitor. So here we'd very much focus on analyzing the differences. I would take individual blog posts and then I would compare them. What are your competitors covering that you are not covering? And do you have a unique element or something that makes you stand out from your competition. That is super important. So to be a little bit more precise, let's say that we have a search query that we are ranking for, but we're not ranking as well as the competitors. So what I would do to be very practical now, um, I would dive in and take the top three ranking competitors on this specific search query. And then I would compare them to my own content. And then I would see what sections am I missing to cover, which my competitors are actually covering. Is my content easy to read? That means do I have short paragraphs? Is my writing enticing? Am I using images to illustrate it? Do I have a table of content if it's long content that I'm writing? And overall, how is the user experience of reading your content compared to your competitors? And it's always difficult because we always think that our content is simply the best content. It's the best content I've written it myself. But we have to be critical here and really ask ourselves those questions that that can hurt a bit, but that's what will make us better in the end and create better content. So when you have covered those areas, then you can actually take your content, again, now I'm being very practical, but you can take your content and run through a content optimization tool. Here you can use something called Phrase or Market Muse, and these tools will analyze the SERP and find phrases and keywords that are important to rank on this search query that your competitors are using that you might not be using or you are using. And based on all of these phrases and keywords, then you get a content optimization score. And this content optimization score, you of course want to be as high as possible because the more keywords and the more phrases that you cover without doing keyword stuffing, the better your content will be in the end because the more complete it is because we don't want thin content. So that is definitely, if I have an existing website, that is how I would approach that. Um, still thinking that you have the foundation and the foundation comes with the next question if you have a new website. So a completely new website is not so much uh, on content to begin with. Here I would focus on the foundation and then I would write the content. And by foundation, if we have a starting point that we say we have a WordPress website, which is 
the most popular CMS system to build websites today. Fun fact, more than 50% of the websites in the entire world are powered by WordPress. It's quite incredible. But then I would set up a WordPress website, of course, get a domain, get some cheap hosting somewhere, because in the beginning, you just need to get it up and running, and it doesn't need to cost a fortune to make it run. And then I would install, again, I'm being practical, but I would install some plugins. I would install a, a caching plugin, which could be WP Rocket, or there's also some free ones called WP Fastest Cacher. Then I would install an SEO plugin called Rank Math, which is entirely free to use, and it's by far the best SEO plugin. Just those two that you're very far. You can take it a step further and install an image optimization plugin like Imagify or Short Pixel. And just with those plugins, then you really have a strong foundation to start writing content. Because with Rank Math, you have all the basic SEO elements for when you write your content. With WP Fastest Cache or WP Rocket, you ensure that your website loads as fast as possible. Because if I don't know if you've ever tried to go to a website and it took longer than three seconds to load, you almost think something is wrong because it takes so long to, to load. And that's what we want to avoid. We want it to load super fast. And that's exactly what WP Rocket does. And the same with an image optimization plugin. It also optimizes your image. So it loads faster, all of your images. And that's what it's all about when we talk about performance for your website. We want it to load as fast as possible because that gives a good user experience for when it is that you read the content, you click around on the content and on the website that you don't have to wait for it to load. And a, user a great user experience is also a ranking factor for Google. So those are the different approaches I would take if we had an existing website and if it was a new website. That's and I love the fact you've gone so practical there, Philip, because I think for a lot of us, we hear lots of these terms. And I know a lot of people I talk to say, you know, there's all this jargon, all this kind of, you know, search engine results and, you know, these various plugins and things. But I don't really understand actually then what I need to do practically. So the fact you've given us some really, really practical examples there is it was great, really useful. Um, the one I've been using, so, so my website, just as an example, is, is a WordPress site. And, and I've been using Yoast, which is obviously a very, very popular, uh, very well-known one. Um, your alternative there, is that better than Yoast in your view yeah it is for sure but but i understand you're using yoast because i think just two years ago then yoast were the absolute best seo plugin but they were sleeping a little bit on, on rank math and today rank math they are far ahead they have much more advanced schemas which is something we use to make it easier for google to understand our websites we have more ability to use the different basic seo elements and we get much more help with the optimization schema that's also in rank math and you get an seo audit in rank math and so much more you just get much more functionality than yoast but for sure yoast were one of it was the best seo plugin just two years ago but today rank math has taken them and uh, by far right now in my opinion is the best wordpress seo plugin and this is this is great for me. I love this conversation because I thought I was up to date, and already, Philip, you're you're proving to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, Neil, you're two years behind. And can you see how fast? I mean, I watch this stuff and I didn't even know that. So this is just how much it's valuable to have a specialist and listen to the specialist and keep tracking the specialist. And we'll we'll provide everyone with your, you know, your YouTube channel and your contact details at the end of this, because I think it is so important to have somebody you can rely on to keep you at the forefront. But for me, the first thing I'm taking away from your practical examples there is the fact that that there are tools to help us. We don't need to be thinking that this is all kind of manual activity. A lot of this stuff is it's not automated as such, but there are tools here to, to help us do this, aren't there? So we, yeah, we need to just understand which are the relevant tools and then where to look to be able to use those at the right points. But I think that was so useful for me, really understanding the difference between existing website and kind of reworking that and then a new website because, yeah, it's fundamental different from the way you've described it. So that, that's really interesting. 
I'm keen to look beyond um, just the the written word in text. Obviously, we've talked here about, you know, sort of great content and this having like very, very specific, well-researched, long-tail phrases that can really differentiate you. And I'm guessing, you know, things like thought leadership, where you're kind of trying to own and be very consistent with the kinds of phrases that you use, that can obviously, you know, count in your favor. So Google sees you as a specialist in a particular area. But how do we start to, as um, content creators or website owners, how do we start to use things like images and video content? Is that as important now in SEO as, as the written word? It is 100%. And it's, it's a great question because now with AI, you can basically generate all text that you need, but you can't show uniqueness. You can't show that you have actually experienced with what it is that you're talking about unless you have original images or a video where you talk about it because original images which are images you have taken yourself you show in google that you have gone the extra length to actually show that you have even maybe worked with it or you have experience with it so google is seeing something new and that that is just what it's all about it's about bringing something new to the table because AI is basically just summarizing the text that Google already knows. But if you write content, which is new, and you add images, which Google hasn't seen before, and you add images as well, then you're sending a very strong signal to Google. And it's, it's so important. That's also one of the reasons why I use videos to show that both the readers, but also Google, that I, I have actually experienced with this specific area or this product that I'm reviewing. I'm not just talking fluff and have read the website. I'm just putting in some words here. It's super important because it's the way that you can show that you have experience with the subject that you're talking about. Mm. Yeah, I love that. And I, I think, you know, that is really, really sensible as well as practical advice because um, a lot of the people I've been reading and, and talking to um, have been saying, obviously, with AI, and let's face it, we're all using AI now to make life a little bit easier. Um, but it feels like it's a blend between that first edit. So GPT or something else might give you that first edit of the content, well-researched, and you can use something like Google Bard to get the latest um, you know, hashtags or you know, key phrases that are ranking. So you can use a blend of these tools to give you that first edit. But I, I love the way you describe yes but then you have to personalize it and make it yours so are, are you advocating then that maybe some of what the ai creates is still okay to include in maybe an article or a blog but within that we need to be putting our own interpretation or our own review or our um, own recommendation so that there's a kind of a human element blended with the the AI content, because that, that to me would feel more authentic, more real. Do, does Google see it that way as well? They do for sure. It's, I always tell people using AI that it's completely okay, but don't just generate and post. You really have that face in between and you, you need to read everything through. You need to add your own personal personalization to the elements and to the content. So you show that you actually have experience with it. And it's so important to use phrases like, I did this and then that happened. Or I tried to do this, but then I experienced this. Or in my opinion, this X, Y, Z. So exactly as you say, using phrases like that not only shows, of course, Google, that again, this is personal experience, it's personal opinion. We also show the reader that you have actually gone the extra length to show your own experience with the product and not just generated AI and, and posted it because AI is still generic, but it's a great starting point if you don't like that blank page. And it gives you it gives you some efficiency when it is that you create your content. So I definitely for creating a draft with AI and then going through it and changing it completely because it does give you some ideas of where to take the subject. And sometimes AI actually shows you subjects and subtopics that you have maybe have forgotten completely, but then AI is telling you that you need to cover these as well. So use AI as a tool, don't use it as a person that is just writing your content and then publishing it. Hmm. Do, do you think, I'm, I'm interested just exploring kind of in your travels and your research, um, kind of the future of SEO, because 
it's you know we've obviously had seo since we've had search engines which is now many many years do you, do you feel that with ai and with you know web3 and you know the whole kind of evolving nature of, of digital in its broadest sense do, do, do you feel there is a future for seo or do, do you think that maybe at some point we'll reach a stage where search is no longer a thing because we will be served by things that we don't even need to search on because based on our calendar or our location or our preferences or our behaviors we will just be served with stuff whether that's an image videos recommendations content we won't necessarily ever need to search again do you do you think there'll ever come a time where search is obsolete it's it's such a great question. It's always fun to look into the future about these these things. I think as long as new content is is a thing, then I think search engine optimization will exist because, as I said before, AI can only summarize at this moment. It can't create new experiences. It's not like AI can go out and try a different recipe that doesn't exist and then tell us how it actually tastes. It it can only summarize what is already on the web. So for AI to be able to work, it needs human written content. Otherwise, it will never give us new content when it is that we generate content. So until AI can actually create new content that's not seen before and make their own experience with different products and different elements, then search engine optimization will definitely exist. But I think it will change a lot, especially now when we both have Bing and Google, which are generating answers based on our questions. Now we need to try and optimize for this as well. Whereas before we had something called a featured snippet, which is when you search a question, you get a quick answer from Google. That part is being replaced by now it's AI generated uh, answer. And now we need to try and optimize for that AI generated answer. So it's changing constantly, but I definitely think SEO has, has a future as long as new content is needed for search engines. Hmm. Okay, that's that's interesting, and I think um, yeah, it's a really good reminder. I think to all of us, you know, particularly those people. I'm not one of these people, but the people who sort of think, oh, AI is coming to take my job, or you know, the robots are going to take over the world. What you're actually saying there with that recipe example, which is brilliant, is that actually it doesn't really know anything at all yet. It's kind of it's putting together existing things in a different combination and it's very clever and it's very quick and it's very fast but it's not creating new so until it does this world is going to continue very much in a an evolving state but it won't be a revolution it's an evolution yeah i love that i think that's really clear yeah, and re really really clear for all of us really so to kind of summarize then where somebody would begin this. So, you know, their their manager or their boss or the CEO said, right, we want you to become the SEO expert. We don't really do SEO. We don't have a budget to take this out to an agency or a specialist. You're tasked with doing this yourself. What kind of softwares then would you recommend to begin the journey at each of the stages? I'm guessing we've got keyword research right at the front end, or is there something earlier than that? All the way through to kind of keeping, you know, um, um, keep, keeping a monitor, if you like, of actually how things are um, progressing when we make the changes. Um, in, in each of those kind of stages of SEO, what would your recommended sort of best softwares be? Yeah. That's a, that's that's interesting. A lot of steps. I think, um, of course, if we say that we have the foundation in order and that's that's working perfectly, then I would focus on building a topical map before I was doing keyword research. So a topical map is basically where you describe the different topics that you want to cover, and then you divide those topics into subtopics and even uh, smaller subtopics if possible, because this entire topical map will help you with your keyword research. So when you have your topical map and why it's also important to have a topical map, it's because you want to cover one small area of your entire industry instead of covering small bits and pieces around the industry because you want to show Google that you're an authority in this small in the, uh, niche over here before you branch out. And that is super important if you want to rank and get traffic in the beginning. So when you have your topical map in order, then you can start doing your keyword research. And then instead of, let's say that I'm a, an auto mechanic, 
instead of doing keyword research where I just do a related keyword research for auto mechanic, then I can take that little small sub niche and do keyword research for that, ensure that I cover all areas around that, and then I can move to another sub niche and focus on that. So I take one sub niche at a time until I know that I'm an authority in that sub niche, I'm covering all the subjects, and then I move on. So you make your life much easier doing keyword research, you're much more efficient, and you also get much better results. From there, then at some point, you get to a phase where you need to start optimizing your content. And depending on your industry, it can vary from eight months until one and a half year almost. It really depends on how fast paced your industry is. And to monitor this entire thing, it's so important to have Google Search Console running. It's a completely free tool to use, but it's the most precise data tool you can use, and it's from Google as well. And in Google Search Console, just to give a brief explanation, that is just where you can see how many clicks do you get on different queries, different search queries on Google. You can see impressions as well. You can see how well your content is actually doing. And this is also great for when it, has to, when it is that you have to optimize your content. Because in here, you can see that if your content is getting a lot of impressions, but nobody is clicking, then you might want to optimize your title. Maybe it's not interesting enough to click on, or maybe it's not covering a specific topic that people are searching, and you have maybe missed the search intent a bit. And search intent is what people are expecting based on a query. So for instance, if I search for um, best headphones, best noise cancellation headphones, then I expect to see a list of maybe 10 of the best headphones. I don't expect to see the history of noise cancellation headphones. I'm already past that step. So that's also super important to cover. And when your content has been running and you have been optimizing it, then of course use Google Search Console to monitor it. And there's so many steps, so I'll just go back one step because with the content optimization, you can also use tools as we talked about earlier, like Phrase or Market Muse to optimize it because the world is always changing. There's always new things happen, happening. And maybe in your subject, something new is trending or there's something new that you need to cover and that is why that content, which is getting older, often doesn't have all of the information because we get new information all the time. New products are released, new features, and so on. And also in different industries, new regulations, new rules. So you want to ensure that your con is, content is already always, oh, sorry, that your content is always up to date. And that is where you use Google Search Console, a tool like Phrase or Market Muse to ensure this step. So overall, I would say, get your foundation in order, make a topical map of your topics, your subtopics, and even sub subtopics. Do keyword research, but work on one subtopic based from your topical map at a time. Monitor your content with Google Search Console, and then optimize your content maybe once a year when it is that it has been time basically to, to optimize it because it's been decaying for one year. And that's basically the circle that, that I would run. Mm. Love this topical mapping because, you know, moving away from just the, the phrase content strategy, and I think a lot of people say content strategy, I say content strategy, and what does that actually mean? Whereas topical map suddenly, oh, right, okay, so it's actually topics, it's actually phrases, it's actually meaningful content, then suddenly that's really, really helpful. And I love that idea of drilling down into a niche, a sub-niche, and a, you know, getting even deeper so that it's so super specific. And I think a lot of people, that's kind of a feeling, yeah, but that's so specific, but I want to appeal to everybody. It's like, well, you're never going to appeal to everybody. So, so there's a real benefit here of trusting the process, isn't there? And if you've got this kind of thought leadership or specialism in a topical map subject, then why not go deep and deep and deep and deep to really own it? Because yeah, I guess in that way, you're, you're blocking out the competition. You're blocking out other people kind of owning that space, aren't you, really? So you're really protecting, not in the short term, but for the longer term, because that would be very hard, wouldn't it, to knock away if you're a competitor to you and your ownership is SEO and topical maps, for example, if you own that space, 
a competitor trying to come in because then you've got the longevity of owning that topic over time you're very well protected then aren't you so this is a good both tactical thing to do as well as long-term strategic thing to do have i got that right absolutely yeah and it's also important to remember that in the beginning when it is that you start to write your content you can't just go out and try and rank for these very competitive searches and queries you need to start low and that's why a topical map just makes so much sense because it's easier to rank for a very specific subtopic because your competitors doesn't want to waste their time focusing on that subtopic they want to focus on the topics that get a lot of traffic but you will get to them eventually we need to build up your authority step by step and then in the end you will actually beat your competitors because they are not covering those subtopics so yeah it's there's a lot of benefits doing it that way Mm. I, I was toying with you know what to call this episode and thought I'll just call it SEO with Philip Stemmen because that, that kind of says what it is. But now I'm thinking it's building your authority with topical maps or SEO and topical maps. We're, we're kind of uncovering some search important you know topics here um, and things that I guess a lot of people wouldn't really realize. They'll be using or doing the keyword research and then just popping some phrases into their content and thinking the job is done. But there is a lot more sophistication here, isn't there, to get this right? So when you're kind of talking there about the competitors not wanting to invest the time in this, there's a big opportunity here that if you do invest, the return on investment is going to be massive because not many people are really going to be doing this, are they? Nope, correct. They want to focus on those topics that gives a lot of search volume. They, they don't care so much about the small ones. But you have to also see it like this. If you cover 10 small sub, uh, subjects that only has maybe 100 searches a month, that's still 1,000 potential searches that would go to your website. And then you time that up. And that's one thing. The other thing is, as we talked about, the foundation that now you're covering these topics so it makes it easier to rank for more competitive topics. So you basically see, need to see it as a ladder that you take one step at a time and work your way through it to create the foundation and then in the end, then you can target those super competitive topics. But because you have the foundation, then you will actually beat the competition. So it's it's super interesting. Mm, and it kind of comes full circle back around, doesn't it, to our solving the puzzles, doing the detective work, you know, actually making a change and monitoring what happens. We, we've kind of almost gone, you know, th through a full cycle here. And it's, you know, to me, it just, it is exciting because it's all evidence-based. It's really hard to argue against this actually working, isn't it? Because you've got the numbers, you've got the data to show as evidence to your management team or to whoever you have to prove this to. Maybe it's your client if you're working as a consultant uh, in this space. The fact it's evidence-based is so powerful because it's not just anecdotal, oh, well, Philip says, so therefore I must. It's Philip says, but Philip's got the data. Look, Philip can show you how this works. It's it's super powerful, isn't it? And then to be honest, th this feels like this is putting the science into digital marketing. It isn't just an art. I think a lot of people think it's about making it look good and sound good. I mean, it is that, but this is about putting the science to kind of underpin it and say, yeah, but it's actually got to be science plus art to get success. I mean, did, did you see it in that way? I mean, obviously, you've spent you know many years you know doing the web design and web content and things. It must feel like a balance now between art and science. Definitely, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Because it's still so. One thing is that you're creating your content, but it still needs to be interesting to read. It needs to be. You need to be able to want to stay on the website and read it. Because if you have a harsh website with hard lines and it's not flowing as well, then you click off and you go to the competitor. So they definitely play hand in hand. And I think that's also why Google has added user experience and, and these elements as a ranking factor, because they see that when people have a good experience on a website and everything is playing well, and people, they tend to stay and they, they like the website and they click around because they, they feel comfortable with the website. So it's definitely important. It's mm, great. Really, really useful. And it's so practical, this stuff. And you know, I really thank you for this, Philip, because I know a lot of people are, you know, typing away or writing away in their notepads. I've got to get this particular piece of software. I've got to, you know, go and look at my website. I've got to look at my last few posts and see whether I'm doing what Philip tells me to do. I, I want to keep people connected with you because um, 
I'll put into the description uh, the link to your YouTube channel. But um, where should they go if, if somebody wants to kind of keep up to date with uh, the reviews and the, the kind of reporting that you do in SEO? How can they get in touch with you and keep in touch? Yeah, I'm, I'm super active on Twitter or X, as it's called now. That's where I share everything. And you can also reach out to me if you have any questions. I love to help. And I also do that through my YouTube channel. So definitely Twitter is, is the best place. Otherwise, there's my website, philipsteeman.com, where I just not only share all of my YouTube videos, but I also share my knowledge about SEO and how I'm doing the SEO with the, the way that I believe is correct based on everything that I learn every day, based on my tests, data, and so on. So Twitter and, and my website. So everybody, you need to keep this specialist you know, alongside you, because Philip clearly, as we've seen here, knows way more than you do, way more than I do. So yes, we all need a specialist uh, alongside us. Thank you so much today, Philip, for your time. It's, it has been really interesting and really practical. And I'm going to go away and start looking at some of those tools that you've described, because I'm feeling a little bit out of date now, which is quite embarrassing saying this is my industry too. But um, hey, every day is a learning day, isn't it? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me, Neil. It's been a pleasure. That's great. Thanks again.